Okay, so um, let's get cracking. I'd like to briefly introduce our first speaker, who's uh, Rajan Ravel. Rajan is a professor at SEPT University and senior advisor um, of the Center for Advanced Studies in Building Science and Energy, which is CARBC at SEPT Research and Development Foundation, which is CRDF. Uh, Professor Rawal is the first Indian architect to receive the status of ASHRAE Fellow in 2020 and also IBIPSA Fellow in 2021. He's also ASHRAE Distinguished Lecturer. His current focus of uh, work is on passive design strategies, net zero energy buildings and communities, personal thermal comfort systems and practices of adaptive thermal comfort models. So with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Professor Ravel for his keynote, uh, which I'm very excited to hear. Thank you, Professor Shukumar. Thanks for inviting me to deliver a keynote at Building Simulation and Optimization Conference uh, 2022. I congratulate for organizing this, uh, and I'm glad that uh, England is continuously doing an annual conference, uh, which is sort of regional conference, and I am glad that such activity is also taking place at uh, various regions. Uh, I would be talking about how building simulation is uh, important in a global south, and uh, also will demonstrate some of the activities which my university is doing since quite some time. Uh, we know that uh, SDG goals are sort of important and building performance simulation, and I use the acronym EPS, is far more important nowadays than even a uh, few years before, uh, earlier. The reason for that is we know that the wet bulb temperature more than uh, just air temperature, wet bulb temperature is, is increasing in, especially in the regions of Southeast Asia. Uh, we get uh, worst heat waves this year where wet bulb temperature actually reached close to 32 degrees. And uh, RCP scenario four and a half suggests that it would be a sort of business air refill and may exceed 35 degrees, which is actually a survival threshold for human beings by 2100 under RCP 8.5 scenario. Now, when we look at this, we also try to look at how our work hours are going to reduce. And this is a recent World Bank report which talks about climate investment opportunities in India, especially in the cooling sector. And the report suggests that we will have anything between 10 or 11% to about more than 40% of, uh, of our share, work, working hours, which would get lost primarily because of the intense heat waves. Uh, presently in India, our energy consumption is much below the per capita global average, which is around 70 kilowatt hour, as against 275 or 72. But it is soon to go up. About 11% household in India do have air conditioner, but I will show you in the next couple of slides that how the air conditioning penetration is also increasing, especially room air conditioner in the residential sector. Uh, by 2050, when we will be about 100 years old after independence, 45% of our peak demand would come primarily from the space cooling, which is air conditioner. Uh, this is the top, this is a slide I was mentioning that if you see some of those states, Delhi, Chandigarh, which are in the northern region or northwestern region, uh, right now under certain scenarios, they do not, I mean, presently the air conditioner penetration is much lesser, but as you can see under RCP 8.5, probably our average air conditioner option rate would be close to 100% uh, by 2040. And that is going to add a lot of stress, not just on our electrical grid, but also the way we operate our residences and the way we operate our buildings. However, there are some good news. Good news is that we have an India cooling action plan. India is one of the first country which came up with a cooling action plan and that helped us 
roll out how our cooling demand is going to affect not just in a buildings but also cold chain and so and so forth. We have one of the best building codes in India. It started with the commercial buildings. Now we have residential building codes, which is in the place, in, which is in the process of implementation and enforcement. However, enforcement rate is low, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to implement it well. Market is also sort of ready. Uh, green building raging programs have matured in this country. Availability of technical services to meet the energy efficiency building codes or even the products such as lighting and controls and air conditioner we do get high performance products as well in India so that's way market has also matured and hopefully we'll be able to carry on with a similar kind of approaches with increase in MEPS minimum energy performance standards of appliances as well however there's a bad news Bad news is that a false sense of accomplishment and that too primarily because of the intent based activities. Our actual improvement on ground is really not meeting the kind of intent which we have obtained. A lot of announcements are taking place. Green building rating programs are recognizing the highest performing buildings, but that too on intent based. We really need to tighten up our belts to make sure that the way buildings get designed, they also get operated with the same stringency, with the same efficiency, with the same health and well-being standards. Hence, sort of BPS also needs to move, not just as an intent-based design assistant tool, but also should start helping how do we really operate our buildings? How do we really operate and maintain our buildings so that people get a good amount of thermal comfort as desired without spending too much on energy and BPS has another role also that apart from the solutions which we have found in a global north, much more contextual solutions are required for the global south. Not just a solution, but that need to be practiced as well. The journey is long. We really need to find enough and appropriate solution for almost all contexts. As all of us know, that silver bullet really doesn't work everywhere. And BPS also probably needs to go certain kind of alteration, certain kind of uh, a change in a practice. Whereas I mentioned that just as a design assistance tool, which actually supports the intent also bps needs to move towards how do we really operate our buildings to meet the original objectives or to meet intent what we really need to do especially in the tropical regions or tropical countries like india is maximize the favorable outdoor conditions we really need to adopt the adaptive thermal comfort theory and we do have a policy in place which allows us to operate buildings as for adaptive thermal comfort. That means the whenever is outdoor is comfortable, we should be able to take advantage of that. Whenever outdoor, outdoor becomes harsh, we should be able to close our window tightly and we should be able to operate our buildings through the efficient air conditioning systems. BPS also probably would be required to design and operate personalized thermal comfort systems. And at another scale, BPS also would be required to manage our GNG emission at the urban scale. So next couple of ne next few slides, I will talk about how these three can be achieved uh, through uh, use of BPS. We know that whenever outdoor is comfortable, probably there are ways and means to operate windows, the ways and means to operate a certain kind of systems where you get outdoor, you get a favorable advantage of outdoor and you can, you can operate your buildings. Application as adaptive thermal comfort theory, as I mentioned earlier, is crucial to do this. Uh, I will talk about a little bit more as well for the PCS and, and, and urban energy. Uh, there are a couple of papers which I would like to cite here. One actually helped us design 
the adaptive thermal comfort model for commercial buildings. And these models have a building type specific equations or models, one for naturally ventilated, one for mixed mode buildings and one for air conditioned buildings. The residential buildings also can be covered under a new recently published paper, which is actually proposing India model for adaptive comfort for residential buildings. This particular model is dealing with the mixed mode operation of the buildings primarily because we have seen the large amount of new construction as well as retrofits are now being operated through the room air conditioner some part of the year, some part of the season, some part of the day. What you see on the right hand side is a sort of comfort band. Uh, the green dots which de uh, demonstrates the amount of hours which we can operate our building in a comfortable zone. And as per an adaptive theory, the, the, the set point temperature inside goes up during the afternoon time, uh, during, the, during the mid of the year, which is April, May, June. And again, towards the winter, the, the set point or neutral temperature does drop towards about 25 degrees or so. It's very important that we also try to understand that kind of outdoor temperatures which we have, what is the potential of operating buildings in a thermal comfortable conditions, how many hours, and this is one example I'm providing here, is that in Ahmedabad it's possible if you design buildings pretty well, it is possible that about 36% of the time one would be able to operate buildings in a comfortable environment, a neutral temperature as per the model. Uh, this ninth quadrant does demonstrate when we will require dehumidification heating, when we will require pure cooling, about 10% of that. Cooling and, cooling and humidification is about 10%. Uh, Only humidification, again, it's about 8-7%. Uh, to 7%. But as you can see here, the humidification, where the wet bulb temperature outside is going higher and higher, about 20% of time we just require dehumidification and that's where some of the technologies which are prevailing in the market does not allow us just to do a dehumidification and that's where also the standards and labeling program needs to encourage new kind of technologies to come in. What you see in the heat map, again it does take into the account uh, what is outdoor dry bulb temperature which we are seeing. And on the right, on, on the bottom, opportunities to operate buildings when windows are open. So in the occupancy hours, what are the ways and means by which you can operate, or what are the hours where you can operate windows and take advantage of outdoors? So all that blue, which is which you are seeing is a comfortable hours, possible to open window, but when it comes to occupancy hours and office time, all that white doesn't really allow us to operate windows, but there's still, there are certain possibilities where you can open windows in, uh, and, and operate your buildings. Uh, similar kind of chart here, which basically suggests that your windows are either closed or open. And on the bottom, you can get how many hours you require a hot, how many hours the conditions would be warm, which might not be very stressful, but at least uh, will also not be a very, very comfortable. Uh, how many times do you require cooling and so on and so forth? This is, uh, this is I'm showing you primarily for Ahmedabad, where I come from. Uh, need, need to mention that horizontal axis, we have number of hours, vertical axis, 24 hours, and horizontal axis, as I mentioned, is that days, which we uh, depict here how important the window is and upper graph where you see the dark black uh, dots where windows are completely open uh, sorry uh, yeah it's completely open and in the white where you see windows are completely closed and there are also in between uh, uh, operation factor 75 percent or 50 percent or 25 percent window is open which you can see in the gray area or gray dots Energy implication of that is what you can see on the bottom part, where about maximum 1200 watts of energy would be required for a particular thermal zone in a residential environment. 
uh, which can go down to probably about 650 or even less than that. Whenever you can open window, you can take advantage of outdoor, otherwise you need to shut your windows and start operating. So there are a little bit of possibilities of operating buildings in a in a operating hours during uh, during some kind of seasons in a in a mixed mode operation. So this is where I was I'm trying to sort of emphasize that the way forward is a mixed mode design, not just to design but mixed mode operation as well. And that's where the BPS can play a crucial role. Next few slides, I'll talk about how the personal environmental control system we call the PEX also will play a crucial role and simulation of that would be key. PCS or PEX basically are the systems where you do not condition entire volume uniformly, but by design, you provide a comfortable situation or a neutral condition where people are working during the, during the operating hours. So provide localized condition around the occupants and also provide the local controls uh, through the local devices to the occupants. Uh, there are a number of ways uh, in, a, in a heating dominated climate, people are using heating panels or air sleeves or palm warmers or even movable panels, which are fitted with the radiant heating panels or sometimes desktop mounted seats and so it's called. Similar kind of approaches have been seen uh, in, the, in the cooling uh, approaches as well, wherever you have a seat which can cool down on its own or a fan fitted with it, or even a simple uh, ventilation fan, which can provide a higher uh, air velocity around the certain, certain body parts along with the cool air, without cool air, so on and so forth. The kind of work which I'm presenting here was in a three stages. One is a theoretical calculation using the first principles, looking at how radiant panels can provide a cooling to the human body, how skin temperature and heat flux from the skin uh, will vary under various conditions. Uh, primarily view factor towards these radiant panels makes a lot of difference. The similar kind of approach was adopted uh, under simulated environment using JOS 2 and JOS 3 uh, uh, models, uh, thermoregulations model and my meant. And then also we uh, work on the experimental side, trying to validate some of those results, which you can see on the right hand side extreme, where a thermal mannequin was used to understand whether it is feasible to operate buildings with the PEX inbuilt and especially with the radiant panels and so on and so forth. Uh, multiple uh, scenarios were built, built up. Uh, room temperature was kept at 26 degree or 28 degree or even higher 30, 30 degree. And while the room temperature was at elevated uh, level, we created a delta using a, using a panels which are radiant Radiantly cool panel, and when I say delta, it's delta between air temperature and surface temperature of the panel. This this delta was ranging between zero degree. That means if air temperature is 26 degree, surface temperature of the radiant panel is 26 degree. Or when we say delta H, that means air temperature is 26 degree and surface temperature at 18 degree. This also was uh, was designed uh, device using some of the uh, criteria for condensation, amount of relative humidity we have to be maintained in the rooms and so on and so forth. So we avoided condensation while we create a high delta between air and surface. Uh, various body parts were examined as one can see here, the 15, uh, 15 body parts and how the skin temperature varies according to these delta uh, temperature variations, how uh, the heat flux is varying from, from, the, from the skin, depending upon what kind of temperature gradients which we are uh, creating. This is, uh, this is a simulation uh, using a thermoregulation model, and then trying to look at what will happen if at all you start providing such kind of uh, uh, gradiently cool or uh, any other panel. So what we have concluded that when you have a surface and air, which is of delta of eight, 
probably it is possible that you create about 11 percent of savings also uh, in certain uh, area where you have a delta of six where your air temperature is 26 and surface temperature is about 20 degree you have a savings of about four percent at the localized at the one unit level uh, market is now getting ready with left hand side what you see in some of the images the residential sector is using a very small uh, 0.5 ton or 0.3 ton uh, air conditioner just to make sure that the, the, the area around the sleeping area is comfortable during the night and not try to uh, cool down the entire volume of the room. So I do see a large potential for PEX as well as uh, PPS for building performance simulation when one has to put various uh, models, thermoregulation uh, thermo models and uh, whole building performance models together to figure it out how the PEX is going to function in future. Uh, third example is that how building performance simulation is going to help, especially in the global south to, to mitigate some of the GHG emissions or even to develop inventory at the urban scale uh, of, of GHG emissions in sense. Well, this is an example which I'm showing you is a part of Indo UK project. Some of you will have an uh, opportunity to look at what is happening under Indo UK project. There are four streams running. Uh, the work which I'm demonstrating here is in a collaboration with the University of College London and a Bentley system. Uh, we created a three dimensional uh, model of Ahmedabad uh, using a drone and using a photogrammetry method. And then once we start looking at individual buildings, their characteristics, their, their, their construction pattern, window to wall ratio, and so on and so forth, we started looking at how can we really optimize municipal services, uh, to, which, which basically consists of water supply and uh, sewage system and uh, other municipal services to serve these buildings. Uh, using some of, the, some of the advanced computing techniques, the residential building, commercial buildings, or archetypes of the buildings we have been identified through the machine learning and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. All, also, when we start extracting the footprints of the buildings using uh, based on photogrammetry, what are the trees, what are the uh, roadside uh, uh, structure which should not be counted as a buildings, all that work happened uh, using some of these advanced techniques. And then finally start putting things together, uh, all kind of data which is available either from, uh, from the administrative data or a previous projects or benchmarking data. When we start looking at it, obviously the availability of data sometimes is limited availability. Sometimes one needs to be careful about the quality of data. Sometimes even a privacy regulation doesn't allow us to look at the data. But point is that when you start looking at this urban energy modeling kind of activities, data source will not be only one but multiple and variability in that also will, uh, will be very, very high. We put together these uh, multiple sources and as a part of the uh, urban energy model, uh, started looking at what is the level of detail which is required to understand certain amount of uh, energy consumption or GNG emission. Again, it depends upon uh, quality of data. It depends upon availability of data. If you have a level of details available at very high level, uh, just in the geometry level, what you can arrive at. If you have more semantic data, if you have more detailed data, which is level of detail four, even even the level of detail between three and four, there would be one or two more steps. Uh, what all can you uh, infer? Uh, Reasonable amount of work has already happened. We are just closing the projects uh, using some of the advanced techniques, as I mentioned. What were the implications of the codes? Uh, if you start looking at energy codes only for certain kind of buildings in, in, in Ahmedabad, how do you really develop a business district uh, in Ahmedabad? So another activity which we did that existing area which has been recognized as a future central business district for Ahmedabad where currently we have a building which is residential and commercial together, but the, the floor space is much lesser. How do we really convert that area into, uh, into the CBD, uh, 
central business district without even increasing the energy performance index epi or eui what we understand so various measures has been proposed uh, and trying to de-link uh, or rather trying to have a regard for climate emergency as well as have to have a regard for what what kind of development uh, uh, countries like india would require and trying to balance between these two this is where i think uh, BPS has a great role to play uh, in, in, especially in the in the developing economies like it. So the point is that we really, really require a very diverse, but a contextual solutions, and that can come from building performance simulation. I'm sure because the basics, the way science has been worked out, and the way things has been uh, 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 devised as a part of the B BPS tools. Uh, we do have an opportunity to find more and more contextual solutions uh, uh, for, for various contexts. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that we really don't create new problems while we really solve, while, while we are engaged in a solving one of them which we have. Point I'm making here is that the intent-based systems or just a design assistance is not enough. We really need to make sure that whatever we design also gets operated and maintained as it has been designed. Obviously, there would be a plus minus, uh, some kind of negotiation is there. Even BPS also needs to be uh, 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 rephrased over a period of time based on operation and maintenance, but we need to have those flexibility built in when we start looking at some of the tools. So, point is that yes, let's not, we need to hurry up, but we really need to make sure that it is a long process, it's a marathon, and we should not really sprint that. I would like to acknowledge the title of this uh, lecture. It basically comes from a book uh, written by uh, Augen Peterson. A book is a long obedience in the same direction, disciplines in the instant society. Thank you. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Rajan, for that very thought-provoking and wide-ranging uh, talk. Um, um, we've sort of had this idea of BSO 2022 looking at the Global South, and you've hit on some of the key themes uh, in there around, um, you know, from a Global South perspective around issues of availability, quality, and emerging issues of things like privacy and how these things interact um to uh you know um create issues and how do we actually move forward and i think this title of a long obedience um is a very interesting one because it reminds us that this is we are on a long march and we actually need to keep going uh, at it so thank you very much rajan i'm conscious that uh we are on a tight schedule and i would love to take questions but i think if the audience would like to pose questions in the Q&A channel, uh, perhaps we can take questions together with Wolfgang and uh, Rajan, uh, maybe towards the end of this, depending on how long Wolfgang speaks for, um, if that's okay. So Wolfgang, are you ready to go? I'd like to briefly introduce you if you are. Excellent, there's, there Wolf, there's Wolfgang. So. <clears throat> Um, for those of you who don't know Wolfgang, uh, he's based at Transola um, in Germany. Uh, they have several offices um, in Germany. I think there are also offices internationally, if I'm not mistaken. And they have been working on low energy and low carbon and sustainable building design for many, many years. And um, uh, and I, Wolfgang and I met uh, in Colombia, I think it was for the first time, uh, at a conference where he and I were on one side of a debate and on the other side <laughs> was an architectural theorist uh, who had strange notions about the role of science and engineering in architecture. Um, and we were there holding uh, the, uh, our end of the debate together. Um, and okay, so I think it looks like Wolfgang is ready to go. That's a good prompt. So over to you, Wolfgang. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for in inviting me. I hope you see the, the right screen, which is the big screen, and not the presenter. Could you quickly confirm that? 
Thank you very much. Um, I have the great pleasure to keep you awake a little bit at that, uh, at that time and uh, share a little bit my thoughts about uh, thinking about uh, what is building simulation actually good for. And let me uh, share a little bit from our practice, what we do at Transolar, where we use building simulation as a, as a, as a strong tool um, to actually inform design. What I want to mention, and, and that relates uh, to the uh, discussion what um, uh, Sukuma just made, this, this discussion what we have with architects. So where do we place our services? Where does uh, building simulation get um, to a um, tool which really informs design? Um, and I want to say that we, we see more and more that building functions have been delegated to systems and technologies away from architecture. And architecture would basically, in my, in my view, uh, has the power uh, to, should get the power back to optimize the passive performance of the building. And this can be significantly supported when um, building simulation is used as a tool to, co to verify concepts in a very early stage. In my understanding, this would help uh, that the building performance would holistically improve and the design in between architects and the engineers could focus on where is the, uh, the building to be um, best improved. And that leads a certain kind of communication and I will share an example out of this. What we often see is super detailed um, simulations for solar, for energy, for comfort. And I'm often wondering how do they are really linking back to inform the design. When these simulations, because they are so detailed, come at a late stage, they typically are too late to unlock the holistic design of an innovative building. So let me quickly jump into this. What we typically try to do at Transula is to bring this complex thing together. So if we, if we, we need to look into the topic of comfort, and we heard that from Raja and how many aspects that it could have on a, on a building scale, on a personal scale, thermal comfort, visual comfort, and indoor air quality, so basically, this is the target we design for people. We want to design that. And that needs to cover uh, many, many aspects of the building and the performance of the building. So that needs somehow to be married and related to energy, to, to the, the system performance of the, of the uh, HVC system, but of the building performance. Both things need to be really married. And that's, that's what we think. And that's what we try to our office going through an iterative design process where we bring both sides together because we have that global agenda, reducing the carbon in the built environment and to build a future which is using less resources but creating comfortable buildings with a high resiliency and a high autonomy. Let me show these things, what I have in mind on a project in Singapore, a city which is known for its heavy reliance on air conditioning. And let me show you an example, which is the School of Design and Environment number four, which was actually designed around the idea how to create a net zero energy building. So the vision was great. The vision for this School of Design where the next generation of architects is basically educated in Singapore was to create a high comfortable university, which is net zero. So that the students where the faculty can really experience how such a building performs. Let me do a quick check based on the typical office average energy use intensity of about 250 kilowatt hours per square meter in a year and the typical production on a roof which is a little bit higher that would be a single story building in Singapore. So from the very beginning when Transola became engaged we, we figured out we need to do something to optimize that building. We cannot just play with a little bit improvement in technique and technology we need to significantly optimize the building, meaning to understand where is the energy in this building going to and what can be improved in this building. And that went, that, that laid the grounds for a process which we call the energy story and the comfort story. And I will share a little bit about what we did. So looking on the climate and overlaying these, I would say the boring climate of Singapore, always the same temperature range with an adaptive comfort band and uh, um, Rajan just in, uh, introduced a little bit about these adaptive comfort thinking. We see that part of the year, actually, the green band shows an adaptive comfort and range of adaptive comfort in Singapore with some peaks. So this is where the, the climate is really interesting to work with. And our idea was, OK, then take that a step further. Leave the conventional approach where operative temperature of 24 degrees needs to be optimized. And we optimize systems to achieve 24 degrees. 
leave this path and think about how can an adaptive approach leading to um, operative temperature in the space of 29 degrees, which is a ridiculous high number in the context, context of Singapore, but putting that into other climate zones, putting that into other projects, putting that into other uh, countries, I would say that's still uh, a way to go to higher temperatures. Putting these operative temperatures in a system, in a context with tempered air supply and elevated airspeed, that creates perfect confidence. Just have two slides. I'm not going more into these details. This is a psychromatic chart on the left-hand side. And if you see the cursor moving, ambient conditions are always too high in temperatures and too high in humidity. And this little tiny dot uh, set here is the conditions in the space, these green dots, and it's uh, absolutely comfortable and we have a high energy demand when we use an, uh, a conditioning system for this. What if we change the concept to adaptive comfort, going to higher temperatures, going to higher humidities, elevating the airspeed, so creating a, a, a comfort through a gentle breeze, we have a significant drop in energy. So there is a huge potential going down this path and using thermal uh, building simulation for comfort and for energy to unlock a way greater potential than just looking on systems. And that needs basically a process where we need to think about how we get that involved. So linking that to the architectural idea, which was rejection of the standard form, leaving the box open it, have a, a building which is open with platforms where the air goes through with its breathing, which is protecting itself against the strong tropical sun and basically use the same protection uh, on the roof to produce renewable energy. It was somehow a link between this climate. It was a link between these climatic ideas of adaptive comfort with this architecture. And I show you some uh, images of the building, how it looks like, that was the roof, how people walk towards that building. And you already can see how parts of the building have been even taking the idea of adaptive further, creating outdoor spaces, open spaces, where the faculty members, where students uh, can uh, wait, can meet, um, embracing the nature at the site, being very careful, being a very good neighbor and uh, using uh, and, and embracing the, the, the nature at the site and opening up the building towards that beautiful uh, context. That's an, a lecture room. And that's one of the seminars room, which I come to in a second, um, which was completely rethinking how do we create comfort so that these people, that the students, that the design studios will happen in very comfortable conditions on the one hand side and the other hand side, somehow being more linked to the local climate, to the local lifestyle using adaptive comfort strategies. And that is immediately resonating with the students. They open the facade. They want to be closer to nature. They want to hear the birds. They want to get the, the smell. They want to see the trees. They open the facades. And when an adaptive building is designed, it's way closer basically uh, to the outdoor temperatures and the ambient temperatures. When these things, when these indoor and outdoor uh, um, conditions come together to a kind of mid-door situation, then it's easier to transit from the closed box to the open box and to transit between the two um, conditions. To get to this, and that's back to my, uh, to my uh, argument, is it's necessary to think about a process and, and to understand the role of simulation experts, of modelers, of energy modelers, of comfort modelers. This particular service is key to integrate between the different stakeholders. When we when we really want to optimize buildings, simulation and verification for simulation is so key to really put the focus to the right points. How do we bring that down energy use intensity? How can we get into a dialogue to optimize the building design, the thermal zoning, the building opti operation, and challenge the client towards his understanding? What kind of comfort do we want to have? Do I want an AC because I had AC yesterday and everybody has AC, or do I want comfortable places? One of the key elements of the design where, model, where the energy modelers, climate engineers, energy comfort experts really should play a stronger role in future design to optimize and unlock the potential, just to share a rough number. I think this is close to 50% what you can do here. Minimize energy use intensity by playing um, a strong advocate for energy efficient systems with the MEP 
a guy and once the job is done in step one and step two, then gets to the idea of maximize the renewable energy production at the site. And I often try to share that with my designers, with my architects, with the clients in very, very simple diagrams like this. So let's optimize our building. Let's reduce carbon, not only in operation, but get a, a, get a ticket out here, which is significant. Let's say let's reduce it by 50%. Reduce it in construction to really rethink how could a uh, resource efficient construction look like. Reduce it by 50% and really be aggressive in the use of re renewables. Not all of that typically can happen at the site, but buildings can be designed to support by a local share of renewables at the, at the site, uh, the design. And that all leads to a call that we need to think about an iterative process where designers, where energy modelers basically um, basically are key to understand the, the definition of the goals, to understand how the design is working at the moment, make an analysis, evaluate the analysis and really cross-check are the combined architectural and climate engineering strategies, are they are targeting, are we achieving our goal? And if not, let's figure out what we can do to improve this. And in this context, thermal modeling has a key role to play because this is the key tool to, to integrate and to support designers. And I want to show you a, a methodology. That's now a picture show of, of probably 20 images, how we have been using and implementing that in the School of Design. So let me run you through a picture show where we said, and we have, first of all, we helped ourselves, our own team and the team of the architect and the team of the executive architect and the team of the client and MEP to understand how and where we can unlock the elements of passive and active design to, to create comfortable conditions. Very typical what you see now on the screen. We said, let's go for a generic modeling for an office, which is this one. Um, typical, we set the schedules. We understood when this occupancy or for the light, we understood. Uh, different schedules when the students come uh, in. Uh, we um, basically set up a, a canvas where we said, okay, let's understand the operation. Let's understand if you see the cursor on the right-hand side, what are the elements of the built environment, the roof, uh, the walls, the facade, the floors and the ceiling. And let's understand uh, the operation, which is on the left-hand side. And what we did is basically we created a, a, a story where we went through different elements of the building, P1 to P8, and then we went through an optimized building and the system to create a story where we looked on different moves and different items to optimize a building. And why is that care? Uh, why, why is that so important to, to go through a process like this because this is unlocking and changing and shifting the paradigm, what is in the focus. I give you an example in Singapore. When a design is optimized for natural ventilation, then there's automatically a set of definition following about infiltration, about the facade, about the glazing, about the windows opening. And we wanted to turn that around and say, let's don't think that a naturally ventilated building needs a poor facade. Let's do it the other way around. Let's, let's try to optimize the building so that the natural ventilation mode is, is way more uh, important and is, is supported by the design. So what you see now in the picture show, changing the sidewalls, thinking about how important is insulation of the wall, how important is insulation of the roof, how important is uh, insulation in the balustrade, for instance, a better U value, G value in the facade, G value, sorry. How important uh, is an overhang with the orientation in the tropics uh, in the crater? How would that support? How would even the floor cover, so increasing thermal mass in the building or uh, lo uh, lowering the thermal mass, uh, change the design? Very important. How do we deal with the infiltration? And bringing that all together, we created a kind of reference for the best design. And I show you just quickly images where we went through the very P1 to P6, and you see. Um, in a very, let me say, rough breakdown, active and passive, where in specific end energy for cooling and heating, you see that you probably go from around 200, 220 down to 60. So you can unlock the significant um, energy um, demand to keep all these spaces at the same temperature, same humidity, same conditions. Translating that into electric, sorry, into, into electric use intensity, we see that this probably drops from around 50, 60 to 16. 
and we still need to deal with a high active, I'm coming to this, and an internal load discussion. But it created already a sequence with our um, the entire design team to understand, okay, let's optimize the building. Let's bring it together with an optimized system. So all the things what we learned here, let's do them in a reasonable optimization and then think about systems. And here we totally escalated. We went through systems where we had floor cooling, sorry, floor heat, um, cooling in the ceiling, cooling in the floor, where we went to systems which are very unlikely to be used with a super high latent and sensible heat recovery. We just escalated the systems to understand what would be in a, in a question, what would be the next better move to go to? And we went through uh, and we came to, the, uh, also we looked at uh, hybrid cooling where we supply temperate air. We always supplied the same fresh air. So all the air condition, uh, indoor air qualities have been the same. And we even uh, combined these um, and created a, now an extended chart showing, look, if, if we really bring down the passive loads uh, in the building, we can significantly drop them down. Um, we can even make comfort better. These, uh, these two uh, systems are with high comfort. We can really drop it if we really go to what we call a Swiss design with a super high efficient uh, air conditioning. We can really significantly drop. And in, in the EOI, it's easier to see from something like 200 and close to 250, 240, down to something like 100. We could identify what other things what need to be happening, what to be optimized. This long story was so helpful to get everybody on board to create what we call a net energy story, which was helpful to create, let me say, the understanding across the process, the understanding across all disciplines, what we need to do. If this is the potential at the space, and this is where we started at the design, we've been four, a factor of four away from the energy target. And then we went through what, what you just have learned in detail in a, in a step of seven, what we call design charrettes, where we informed that even with the best envelope, we can drop probably uh, some, something like uh, 25%. But we need, if we get to the highest efficient AC system, we can roughly drop it by 50%. But we need to look into new and an innovative ways to create comfort. We call it just hybrid system, but it's basically adaptive comfort with hybrid systems and temperate air supply. Then we went again through the same loop. We optimized, once we agreed on this, we optimized with the digital system uh, simulation. We looked on, uh, we addressed several concerns, humidity, uh, buildup of mold, things like that, to come down to an optimized building. And as a result, it turned out at the end to be an energy positive building. So it was totally key that we went through this uh, process of um, optimizing the building because that helped us, that helped the entire design team to, to find new paths, which you don't find if you just follow the rules. I think it, it's not necessary to do that all the times, but this, let me say, intense way to, to, to redesign for thermal comfort and for adaptive comfort in Singapore helped basically to inform the code. The code was changed. Um, now it's allowed to use higher temperatures in the spaces in Singapore. It's allowed to let the humidity rise beyond 55% uh, um, relative humidity. And is basically allowed when the temperature and humidity is higher to augment comfort in the spaces with elevated airspeed. Now, examples, what we just saw on the screen, are the examples which help to speed up design and shifting the design towards this world because that's urgently needed on this planet. Because the bigger picture is basically that we live in a world where we have many, many uh, multi multi-million cities and most of them are basically in Asia. And what happened on this planet is basically from the year 20 to 30, and we are more than half through that process. We are, we are, we are significant through that process. These 84 billion square meters, which are going to be built on this planet, and, uh, and most of them are already built, that is something like three and a half times North America, the built infrastructure in North America. There's something like seven times Hong Kong every year. It is important that this is built 
with a sense for what is happening. 60% of what I was just talking about is happening in, is happening in Asia, in countries like India, countries like China. And these are all basically in, in a context of hot and humid in a tropical climate, many of these. So it's totally important that we understand how we design buildings, that the buildings are linked with the design to the local climate, to the local lifestyle. And thinking about that, it's absolutely key that we have a, uh, that we find a good way to inform the design process. And here is where building simulation and modelers, I think, have a great future to inform the design, to inform architects, to inform design teams about the significant moves. And the way how we define comfort, if, you, if this is getting more in context and less copied around the world, if adaptive comfort is more positioned, if adaptive uh, comfort with template air is more uh, actually introduced in the design and back up by simulation that it really works, that the design is verified, that has altogether a significant impact. Buildings designed for adaptive comfort in the tropics consume less energy. And a good number to know this here, it's roughly 50%. Thank you very much. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, it was just as uh, inspirational and uh, interesting as I hoped. So thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. And once again, uh, just like Rajan, I think there's lots of similarities. And certainly the, the one question we have on the forum has picked up on this. Um, this issue of renegotiating notions of comfort um, and actually having those conversations, um, which is sort of hugely important issue, how you actually take a design team together. And it's definitely true uh, of all uh, successful green building projects that the ones that um, have a good um, community of people who are wanting to work together and working in the same direction tend to be more successful than ones where you know the clients or other actors are not necessarily um, aligned towards the same goal. And you talked about goal definition as an important part of this. Um, uh, there was a lot to talk about adaptive comfort and natural ventilation. So I think I'd like to pick up on the question that we've had, which is from uh, Rob McLeod. Um, uh, so thank you, Rob, for asking the question. I hope you don't mind me reading it out. It's quite a long question, but I think it's a very interesting one. Uh, and it's for both speakers, both for Rajan and for Wolfgang. It says, we have been hearing a lot about adaptive comfort strategies as a means of dealing with overheating issues in a rapidly warming climate. But how confident are we as modelers that the current adaptive comfort models are robust predictors of the health implications, that is not comfort implications, but health implications of overheating, particularly for vulnerable groups, that is elderly or those with long-term health issues such as long COVID and whatnot. And what about other cofactors that are not included in our overheating models, for example, indoor air quality, are we using, in summary, are we using the right models and the metrics for this task? So who's gonna go first? Rajan, you wanna have a crack at this and then we hand over to Wolfgang, yes. Sure, uh, I mean, first of all, thanks uh, Robert for the question. Uh, uh, there's one more message coming in anyway. Yes, Isha has uh, That's from Isha. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think, as far as the metrics and models are concerned, uh, again, I would go for an approach where definitely not one metrics which will work for everything, uh, not one model which will work for everything. And that is where I was trying to emphasize that more contextual solution. That means even models needs to be more contextual, whether it is for elderly, it, uh, old age homes, or it is for uh, any other healthcare services and so, on and so forth. So I think, First, if I if I have to say that yes, even models needs to have a diversity depending upon where are we trying to apply that. Uh, second is about the health implication of adaptive model. Uh, my my understanding is that it's very important that we retain our adaptability, and at least in a in a countries where we have not been addicted to air conditioner, if I may use that word. Uh, and while retaining our adaptive 
adaptability, I think it would be appropriate for us to even practice that. And that at least very early stage design research suggests that it will actually help maintain our uh, health as well. Uh, for example, uh, some of the resilient or climate resilience research related activities suggest that one must sweat and one must take a cold shower every day to increase our adaptability and resilience. So looking at some of those, I am sort of confident that yes, uh, these metrics are uh, possible to implement provided they are more contextual. And last point, uh, always a policy and a research have a, some kind of disconnect. And for example, the adaptive model which we have devised actually is more appropriate for four or five regions and there are five models for five regions. But when it comes to policy, the enforcement and implementation of policy becomes so complex that obviously one would like to start with the one equation for the country, even at the cost of scientific merit. And that's how probably things start rolling out slowly, slowly. So that's what my response is. Thank you. Thanks, Rajan. Uh... Wolfgang? Thank you, Rajan. Uh, I, I would like to add an observation from the perspective of the practitioner, which is saying, let's turn it around. Are the air conditioned building the good buildings? Oops. That's typically where we see problems. That's typically where people complain about, oh, that's too cold, that's too drafty. And um, I'm not using that as an argument uh, for, for or against that, but I'm just using that as an argument to say, in the moment when you think about adaptive comfort, you're more conscious about the context and that typically in, is of making the design better. That is what we learned in practice, basically. And air quality basically is always first in my understanding. So the temperate adaptive comfort was um, what we is implemented in the School of Design is all centered around creating, first of all, excellent indoor air conditions, indoor air quality, and then thinking about how to enhance uh, enhanced comfort. And what we observed, and it's probably a finding which we have in many different climates is, and Rajan commented that already, is that we need a diverse and some experience of sweat and a cold shower in the context of, um, of, of our health. So people sometimes uh, working in a totally boring because super fine controlled thermal and high creek environment, these are the ones who jump on a bicycle in the evening, in the rain, just to feel their body and to feel something which is setting the, the body in context to a climatic perception. So what we see, in, and we figured out that some of our large projects, um, for instance, the Atlassian High Rise in Sydney, is exactly interested in this. Clients are interested. Let's create a variety of thermal experiences in a building which is closer to nature, which is bringing indoor and outdoor closer together and offering different um, thermal perceptions. And, and we see that an, an rising interest in this kind of design. So shifting away from a very confined focus on perfect conditions towards a, a, a broader range. I completely agree that this is not a solution for everybody, but I, I would need to say that in the context of building what we design, there's a strong call for it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you, Rajan, both for your thoughts. And um, I just would like to add um, as chair my comment that I think what Rajan said, which is about context, I think is critical. Um, it is the blind application of rules and metrics that has kind of led us into the problem where we are. And uh, you know, that's the thing we have to really mitigate against. You know, we cannot have a situation where, uh, for example, a standard of comfort designed in uh, certain parts of the world is then wholly imported and, you know, been given credence in another part of the world without actually understanding whether it's fit for purpose. Uh, in all the years I've been studying this issue of thermal comfort, um, I've never come away uh, in a single study where I can show that the so-called international comfort standard is something that the occupants within buildings are, are actually desiring. You know, the vast majority of time they find it rather undesirable. And we've just published a paper showing how vast overcooling is, for example, and is driven by this idea of international comfort standards. But I think Rob was asking this question 
Um, uh, and I think hopefully that answer is somewhat satisfactory. Rob, please do respond uh, if you're still there, um, uh, which is, you know, if you've got a very polluted outdoor environment, then the context changes, and that means your response has to change accordingly. And there is this interaction, isn't there? I mean, Wolfgang talked about how in Singapore it became allowable to use concepts of adaptive standard. It became allowable to the uh, for the indoor uh, um, relative humidity to rise above fifty percent. You know, and so and Rajan hinted at this as well. You know, the policy framework and the conditions within which we operate fundamentally allow us to negotiate these um, these design responses. So um, I don't want to take up too much time on that. And uh, Rob, please do respond if you're, uh, if you're still there. I would like to pick up on the next two questions which have come. One from Isha, uh, who, th who thanks both of you for your presentation. And uh, she's very excited about Transola's work. Um, uh, heading straight into the question, she says, you've talked about the strategy process and stakeholders. My question concerns the behavior of building occupants. Um, also, Professor Rajan talked about PECs, uh, personal uh, in, uh, comfort, I think. The building occupants are likely to bring in personal equipments of the slightest hint of discomfort, for example, personal radiators, desk lamps. And this sort of behavior is more impacting when they ship from opening windows to just switching on the air conditioner. How do we as building designers tackle this, especially in India, the air conditioner is also a status symbol of social class. This is actually something, uh, the last statement that Isha made is really resonates with me. I think the signaling in general, uh, in many parts of the developing world in the global south is that the air conditioner somehow helps you overcome your discomfort. And so when we start selling a narrative uh, which I to totally buy into, but I always have this sort of worry in my head, are we trying to sell something that we don't necessarily, you know, the signaling is all wrong, that, you know, people seem to be using air conditioners all over the place, but the moment, you know, somebody else wants to buy an air conditioner, we tell them, no, 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 don't do that. Okay, Wolfgang, you're, you're up for it, go for it. Just a quick response to this. I think there's a, there's a confusion between comfort and air conditioning. So, and I think at, at this start, we tried, at this point, in, uh, we, we, we try to, to disconclude, disconfuse that. Basically, humans are sensors. You are a sensor, Sukumar. We are all sensors. And when we sense a place and we feel good and we don't complain about discomfort, that's the definition of comfort. How that is achieved could be in millions of ways. It could be with an air conditioning system, but we, we are quickly, and that's probably by, because we learned it, that there's a heating system in cold climates and an air conditioning system in warm climates. And that is synonymous to comfort. And that's wrong. And this is to, so difficult to disconnect that wrong belief. But basically here it starts. So what we always say is, let's try to find, a, let's try to create something or we try to bring our clients, the clients to a place where we have already implemented something. And if they don't complain, we just explain, look, this is what you need. You don't need an air conditioning system. Probably you need something, but probably not what you have in mind. And if that makes sense, using the human senses in perception experiments, if you really go to new paths, is a very powerful tool to disconnect that understanding that an AC is a good place. Rajan, would you like to come in on this? Yeah, sure. So well, how much time do we have? Uh, we another have another session. seven minutes before the okay. parallel session starts. So. so, okay, great. Uh, so I'll take probably two minutes. Uh, Isha, I think the point which you're taking, talking about that personal radiators and desk level, and I am actually fine bring, people bringing their own desk fence and trying to put that on a desk, uh, at least that will save some more energy of not operating entire room at the lower air temperature. Uh, we as a designer, how do we really tackle with that? Uh, I suggest that yes, we should simply provide a framework. We also provide a reasonable amount of USB ports so that people can charge and discharge these fans. And that's it and let them let them behave, let them accommodate themselves with the way they want to accommodate. That will provide 
as uh, uh, behavioral scientists suggest that that also will provide them more comfort psychologically because they are controlling their own environment. Uh, there's one more question from uh, IIHS talking about how do we really manage the natural ventilation when we have outdoor air which is polluted or mosquitoes and so forth. I think that is more to do with the with the profession. Uh, definitely, while we work to make our buildings more comfortable, we same architects, planner, urban designer also needs to make sure that cities are healthy, uh, no garbage lying around which breeds the mosquitoes and so on and so forth. And the moment we start working all together for a better built environment, I think these things will be solved very, very easily. Uh, very similar to what automobile industry or what any other industry is doing is that somebody is working on tires, but at the same time, somebody is also working on making sure that roads are better uh, and so on and so forth. So I think it's, it's basically the whole ecology needs to sort of change and profession needs to uh, put in some more efforts to make sure that all strings are attached to well enough to get a nice weaving. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add my tuppence worth uh, since we've got uh, two or three minutes to go. And I'm sure Alan is getting very nervous at this point because he wants to <laughs> move into the parallel sessions. But I'll say the following, which is it's absolutely critical. And, you know, the interlinkages between all of these aspects is so profound um, and often, you know, we kind of think in very piecemeal ways, isn't it? You know, we talk, we, when we're thinking about outdoor air pollution, we are not thinking about the fact that the outdoor air pollution somehow prevents us from designing low energy buildings. It's not a thing. Um, so, uh, you know, we get these in, you know, uh, in India, we get these terrible clouds of dust because somebody's burnt a crop. And the reason they're burning the crop is because they want to make space for the next crop. The reason they want to make the space for the next crop is because somebody had a water policy that stopped them from planting the crop at the right time. And so you've got this sort of vicious cycle of interconnected disasters, which are actually reasonably should be solvable. They're really not that hard. Um, and so uh, it is a tough thing. Um, and sorry, I don't know who it is from IHS that has uh, asked the question. Um, but, you know, it is a tough situation, but it we cannot solve this by looking at one part of the puzzle. We have to attack all parts of the puzzle because they are that deeply interrelated. Um, uh, Rob, uh, I think maybe I'll just take the next few seconds, just read out what is in the Q&A forum. This is fantastic. Um, Rob has uh, said, thank you for the thoughtful answers. Uh, I agree, context is incredibly important in the application of models. The concern is that we have a context which is changing rapidly and is transient in multiple dimensions, climate, heat waves, air pollution, aging, pandemics, uh, and occupancy itself can change significantly over the lifetime of a building. Um, and occupants are inherently non-homogenous. And so the concern is that we could soon arrive at a point where we're designing buildings that are not inclusive, since there's an obvious limit beyond which people cannot adapt. And for that, uh, limit may very well be very low for particular groups. And that's a very well made point, Rob. Um, Clarice, oh, I think maybe Clarice has actually got a question. Do you think we have time? Yes, I think we squeeze it in. Thank you for the talk. A question for Wolfgang. How do you see the design workflow you propose being adapted to mass production, low income self building environments? Uh, i.e. <laughs> the real global south, she says. Um, most of the hot countries are self-building and have no money to hire practitioners. Is there a role for simulation at a different level in these countries? So Wolfgang, I'm going to give you maybe under a minute. And the most honest thing is I have no really good answer. I have no really good clue. But I know that what we have done in Singapore only should have helped to change the code and to create something where others could learn from, don't need to go through the same process. I don't think that is necessary, but in this context, we needed to really block, get, get the road blockers out of the streets to change the design. Now it's up, it, it's speeding up in Singapore. Now it's probably five or six buildings which have adapted the same, uh, the same concept. Even they think about to, to use that in hospitals. So my best answer would be is exploring in a local context what works well, and bring it to a simplistic role, which can be adapted and can be copied easier. 
but copied from the right uh, examples, locally made examples, not from the global north. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Wolfgang. I think it's uh, right for me to say that we almost had a debate between Clarice and Wolfgang uh, until Wolfgang said, sorry, no battles. I just, uh, I'm a very sort of uh, pacifist type person and I would just like to say my thing and get along with everybody. So he decided not to have an argument with Clarice. But I thank you, uh, Wolfgang, for your uh, wonderful talk. Thank you, Rajan, for your wonderful talk. Thank you, everybody who asked the questions. And we will now move to the parallel session. So please leave this link and join the appropriate parallel session for yourselves. Your session chairs should be there ready and waiting. Thank you very much.